This episode, we take a look at an RPG box set, Tales from the Loop Starter Set, based on the awesome artwork of Simon Stallenhag. Before we dive into this starter set, we need to thank Free League Publishing for providing us with an art, a review copy of this RPG. All right, the other thing we do have to note here is this is a read review of a role-playing game box set. Uh, at this point, due to the global pandemic, this is not a game I'm going to be able to get to my table anytime soon. So I haven't gotten a group together to play through this box set. So everything from this point forward is based on only reading the box set. But I have played a number of single sessions of Tales from the Loop. So I have played the game. I am familiar with the mechanics. I played it at various cons over the last two years. And so I'm speaking as someone who's played the full game and familiar with the systems in this box set, but I haven't actually played like the adventure that's in this box set or with this slightly limited rule set. All right, shockingly, even I've played this RPG before, <laughs> and I admit I've also watched the entire TV series, which colors my thoughts about the setting somewhat. Yeah, at this point, I have not sat down and seen the TV series, so that is not impacting my views on this box set at all. Interestingly, the box set now has a sticker on it that says it's it's not based on, but now a Amazon Prime series. When this was released, that wasn't out yet, so. There. Yeah. Sticker. <laughs> uh, all right. The Tales from the Loop starter set was designed by Matt Forbeck, Thomas Harnston, Nils Hintzy, Nils Carlin, with support from a wide range of people, Rickard Antonia, Christopher Grana, John R. John M. McCain, Costa Castulis, and T.R. Knight. It features art from the fantastic Simon Stallenhog. It's actually Stallenhog's art books, is his coffee table books, originally the first one being called Tales from the Loop, that is the inspiration for this role-playing game. Uh, this particular box set was published in 2020, just this year, from Free League Publishing. Uh, it features their Year Zero engine, which was from their most successful RPG, Mutant Year Zero, which is a D6-based system. Check out our Tales from the Loop starter set unboxing video on YouTube to see for yourself what you get in this role-playing mm -hmm. game beginner box. All right, I got to start by talking about the box itself. Uh, this box is nice. It's solid. It's, it's one of the most chunky solid nice pieces of cardboard rpg box sets i've had like it feels like a board game box not an rpg box set box which is a great thing because over the years so many rpg box sets are made of like cheap thin cardboard and they don't stay in the test of time this is the, the kind of thing like i don't know what they expect you to do with them like once you're done throw them out um this is a solid box that i think is going to be great for holding all my tales for the loop stuff going forward right i can keep the dice in there i can keep character sheets if we actually start playing a campaign i'll keep our our, our campaign notes and all of that in that box as for the contents of the box, I got to say, I, it's a little lighter than I had expected. It's a little sparse. Um, all you got is a set of 10 six-sided dice, a two-sided map, five pre-gens, and two rather thin rule books. Now, the look and quality of these are awesome. It's just not as much stuff. I just thought there'd be more in this box. Now, what I'll do is I'll take a look at each of those items in detail and share my thoughts on them. because So you can can know if it's, it's worth picking up for you. So... Up first is the dice. So these are custom Tales from the Loop six-sided dice. I am a sucker for custom dice. I like these 10 dice. You get 10 of them. It's the most you'll need to play. It's the maximum dice pool you can build in the game. Uh, note there is only one set you'd have to share between the players. Um, these are orange, which is it's, 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 it's a certain distinct look. Um, I know it's, it's a 70s, 60s DARPA kind of color look. I like it. And they're cool. They The numbers one to five are just numbers, but they have like um, a ring-like loop symbol on them. And they're, they're clear, easy to see, but it's a six that's replaced by something else. And it's it's the Reeks Energy, or I, Reich's Energy, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but it's it's the Swedish company that owns the loop in, in the, the fantasy setting, the, 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 the setting, the fantastic setting for this. This makes sense because the only number that actually matters on these dice is the six when, we'll just, when trying to to actually get past trouble in the game like to be honest they probably could have blanked out the one through five but at least this way i can use the dice for other games yeah we'll just smile and nod at your addiction to dice i'm clearly yeah. not enough of a role player as i'm quite happy with the same ones i've been using for 25 years or so i don't know i think you're in the minority on that <laughs> one just just look at ttrpg twitter and, and see people talking about their dice constantly i like new dice 10 new dice, they're shiny, they work, and they're not only pretty, they, they are effectively made for the game. The sixes do stick out. 
Uh, next, you have character sheets. These are two-sided sheets. Uh, you got five different kids. On one side is a picture of the kid and some background information. On the front is a pre-filled out Tales from the Loop character sheet. Now, this is worth noting, this is a full character sheet. This is the same character sheets you're gonna get in the full rule book. Nothing is skipped over or simplified. It's a fully filled out sheet. Um, each kid has both a Swedish and an American name, something that's a theme of this set. Uh, the kids include Linda or Aaron, the book run, Isabella or Patricia, the computer geek, Frederick or Chad, the jock, Tim or Timmy, the weirdo, and Maria or Kelly, the popular kid. Now, personally, I don't love having pictures on pregens, uh, but I think that's a very personal thing. I, I'm sure many other people do prefer to have something else to guide them in how to play that player. Mm. I, I prefer the opposite, where I'd like to make it a little bit more mine by not having that picture. But... Totally fair. And there's in any game I can think of running and be like, if you don't like what's there, change it. <laughs> Now, the next one is the rules booklet. Uh, this is 32 pages, gives players the rules for playing a game using the Tales the Loop starter set using the Year Zero engine, broken down into four chapters, with each of these broken down into sections. Uh, oddly, I don't know if this is a Swedish design thing because this game is published by Free League over in Sweden. There's no like table of contents, but each chapter has its page references broken down by sections, which was an odd choice. Now, over on the blog, I do break down this book literally chapter by chapter, section by section, and go through all of it, but I think that's a bit much for the podcast. So what I'm going to do is summarize most of the book here without getting into all those details. As always, you'll be able to check out the blog for all the juicy details we can't take the time for here. Now, the Welcome to the Loop section is the first thing that introduces you to the game and what role-playing is, all the usual stuff. The thing that I think is worth calling out here are the core principles of Tales from the Loop. And I think it's worth listing these off. And for one, I have to give them props for having core principles. This is a, a modern concept in role-playing that, it, uh, I don't know if it was introduced in Apocalypse World, but that's the game that's most known for putting forth right at the front, right for everyone to know the principles of the game before you start playing. This is great for making sure that everyone at the table is on the same page. Now, the core principles for Tales from the Loop are, one, your hometown is full of strange and fantastic things. Two, everyday life is dull and unforgiving. Three, adults are out of reach and out of touch. Four, the land of the loop is dangerous, but kids will not die. Five, the game is played scene by scene. And six, the world is described collaboratively. Interestingly, that number one, that, that strange and fantastic things aspect was what I most missed. I, I turned out, in hindsight, from my initial experience with the uh, Tales from the Loop game. Yeah, and I don't know if that was the, the scenario we played, the, the game master we were under, but I agree. We I, it, yeah, I, it was... We were much more focused on it's the 80s and we're kids than yep. anything fantastic. Kids on bikes more than loop. Yes, definitely. Now, the next section is the age of the loop. This introduces the setting, which we've already alluded to quite a bit. Again, this is based on the artwork of Simon Stallenhog. This is a 1980s that never was, where repulsor technology, robots, teleportation, time travel, and two rather large hadron colliders have messed with reality and made much things much more interesting than the time period I grew up in. Uh, this is a setting that juxtaposes the mundane life of a kid and chores and homework and all that drudgery and bullying and all the 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 things that were great and terrible but being a kid with the fantastic of this messed up weird technology now interestingly two default settings are presented in this there's the malarian islands in sweden which makes sense a swedish game but there's also an alternative setting of boulder coral dorado in the u.s now I think it makes sense in the full game to do this, but it seems odd when there's only one scenario. Like even the names I listed earlier, they're not that much different from each other. Like I just don't quite see why. So from a technological point of view, I think the TV show really exemplifies this setting marvelously. Even if you're not interested in watching the show and there are some mixed reviews about it, uh, I'm sure on YouTube, there's probably a compilation video out there that will really give you an idea of the theme and the tone, which is the one thing mm -hmm. that TV show did really well. 
Another example that what I always picture is Lost for anyone who went through the series of Lost when they go back to the 60s and the whole DARPA or what Dharma, I think it was the Dharma Institute, the whole feeling of that I found never watched Lost. Yep. Okay. For anyone who's lost Lost, I, I, I get a lot of feeling of the Dharma Institute and the weird technologies and having to put in codes and very mechanical machines with counters that were analog. I, I found to me, that's the loop for me. For anyone, any fans of Lost, any fans for at least the beginning of Lost, because I don't think anyone was a fan of the end of Lost, <laughs> which is why I don't actually recommend you run out and watch it. Uh, the next section is the kids. This tells you how to read the character sheet with all the info on the means and uh, the stuff you'd expect. And then we get to the trouble chapter, which that is the key to this system. The game is all about the kids facing trouble. Um, no trouble, not monsters, not it, it's they have to overcome trouble. And this gets to the mechanics. Now, all conflict in the tail of the loop is handled from that viewpoint of trouble. It's the game master's job is to present the kids with trouble to overcome. And it's up to the players to find a way to get past that trouble. Note that's at a distinction from some traditional role playing games. It's up to the players to come up with how to get past the trouble, not the DM to present pre scripted solutions. Um, the way you get past this is they're going to use their attribute skills, items, and then pulling in some other resources like luck and their pride players are basically going to use those things to build a dice pool they're going to roll dice and look for sixes interestingly this is a dice pool system where all you need is one if you have one six at all the dice you win you did it you, you got it now there is some additional rules where if you have extra sixes you can get some additional effect now if a player fails a roll they immediately get the option to push themselves which inflicts a condition on them. It lets them re-roll their dice, but it makes their kids upset, scared, or exhausted. There's a few others. Conditions can also be the consequences at failed attempts to overcome a trouble. So the trouble might be that there's a giant robot there in the street and it's patrolling the street. And if you don't get past it, you're going to be scared. Or if while running past it, if you fail your roll, you might become exhausted or tired out from trying to get past it. Now, again, remember, one of the core principles of this game is that the kids, the characters, cannot die. That is a very important thing when playing a game about children. We're not, this is not a, a, um, a voyeur style game. A, 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 I can't think of the term. Anyway, worst possible condition in Tales from the Loop is broken, which is the, the kid just can't do it anymore. They're done, which stops the character from taking part in confronting more trouble. Now, there are, of course, additional details, like what skills are good for what, working together, group checks, all the stuff you'd expect to find in a role-playing game. So for me, the key here is remembering that trouble should have a twist. Yeah, Trouble shouldn't just be a simple kid problem, though you can take a simple kid problem and add a loop twist to it to be that game, bring it to that game-worthy level. Now, I do think it's worth noting that this is a very narrative-focused role-playing game. Everything is meant to be done, driven by the narrative, which is the conversation happening between the players and the DM at the table. This is a very modern style of role-playing game. You're going to see things that are popular in other games, like Powered by the Apocalypse games, where like the results of dice rolls, I said you can spend extra successes. Well, those are things like ask the DM questions or the players being able to narrate something. It, it's, it's very much an the players and the game master are actively involved in building the world together during play. Right. So uh, many similarities with other modern RPGs, which will make it comfortable for those who play those, but can be unsettling for yeah. those used to more mechanical traditional RPGs. Now, personally, I think this one's, leaning more towards the mechanical traditional rpgs than many modern games compared to a powered by the apocalypse or a fate game this feels much more like the games i grew up playing it just has some of those modern elements finally the last book is the introductory mystery which i don't even want to say the name of i hate the name of this because to me it spoils one aspect of it like i think you're better off not knowing the name of this if you're going to be a player um, this is a short adventure, really short, like 16 pages. Uh, it does a really good job, though, of showcasing the setting and the tone of Tales from the Loop and the contradictory nature of the mundane life as kids of the 80s and the fantastical things around them. And, and that contradiction is really so important uh, to the entire setting. And it, it really features, I think, strongly in the art that Simon mm. has put out. Uh, there's Saturday morning cartoons, but a giant remote control robot bought outside the bedroom window. Yeah. 
Now, I do think it's worth noting the information in this mystery is presented to the Game Master as a series of facts. Uh, this is not a fleshed out story with a lot of details. There's no specific player options aren't spelled out. Like I said, this is not a game where you present the, the players with solutions for them to pick from. There's no box text, right? Like you're not getting your traditional, you read this out loud and something happens. It's more presented as a, here's what's going on. Here are the places the players will probably go and here's what you're going to find there. And here's what that information should lead them. And then here's the final scene that will play out that they should get to from that information. Right. So um, to me, that's very much a, growing up i my favorite system was warhammer fantasy roleplay and one of the things i liked about that versus dungeons and dragons is it presented information this way it would give you timelines and places and events that are going to happen then it was up to you to do something with it whereas as opposed to at three o'clock this is going to happen and the player is going to go this way or that way so more narrative form uh more storytelling as opposed to uh more on rails trad yeah. system now that said uh, it is only like there's only four locations in this entire thing. It's it it again. It's it's a taste, and that's it. That's what you get. You got rule book. You got a sample of entry. You got characters and some dice. Now, before I get onto my thoughts, I do want to say I have some biases when it comes to this particular review, and I feel I need to talk about this. Now, this is in addition. I got a review copy, which I really don't think gives me a bias, but we already pointed that one out. For one, I love RPG starter boxes. I've mentioned it many times. I I I don't know. I collect them. I dig rpg starter boxes i like seeing games distilled down to their simplest form and to me they're a great expression of what the designer thinks you should do with the game it's here's what you're meant to do with my system i love that plus i like having everything in one box and i love the shorter nature the the, the less commitment you have to apply to play them i can get rpg starter boxes played with my normal group getting a long-running campaign going is a whole another story second I'm a big Tales from Luke fan. I played this game. I, I first played it at, um, I think it was Queen City Conquest. It was either that or Breakout, and I can't remember which. And immediately went to a booth at that con and bought a copy of the book. Like, like immediately after playing, I'm like, no, this is cool. And I didn't think I'd like kids on bikes. Like, I really didn't. But that game, Sean played in that game. That game was fantastic, and it scratched an itch I didn't know was itchy. Like, I, I had no clue. So before even opening this, I knew I was going to like the system and the setting. I, I played around with it. I know the setting. I know the system. I'm thirds up. Uh, second... We're both in our mid forties, grew up in the eighties. And I got to say, this is, um, I lived through the setting in here. Well, the non-fantastical <laughs> part and all, I'm all about eighties nostalgia and the references of the eighties. And I knew they'd be in here. There's mixtapes. It tells you what movies came out at different years. I'm like, yeah, I've seen every movie on that list. So I am definitely all for it. So that, that's, that's a whole bunch of biases I had before getting into this box set. Yep. Now, all that said, I'm going to try to judge this box on its own merits and share what I liked and some things I didn't. First off, as already mentioned, I, this was sparse. Like, the, there just wasn't a lot here. Definitely less than I expected. I just thought there'd be more. Like, you're looking at two books, thin books, some dice, a map, and some pregents. The books aren't that thick. The intro adventure is very short, short. Like, this is a single session at most. Like, I don't even think you're going to, you might even be able to hammer this off depending on how much interaction you have um the, and then there's nothing to go past it like it's very much a distinct story that's done there's no additional information on how to create further mysteries or ways to make your own characters or even just like a blurb that says from here the players could go on to explore this and feel free to create that on your own well we should also note that uh Related to that, its MSRP is actually higher than a lot of other starter box sets. Yeah, it's not, I wouldn't call it expensive, but Just, this is, a, we've reviewed the Shadowrun box set. We'll mention it. I reviewed the Shadowrun 6th edition, 6th world box set recently. This is $5 more than that. I got, there's a lot more weight in books and things to read in that Shadowrun books. And there's cards and there's, there's just more there. The other problem I have with this one, which is similar to what I just said, is part of that is it's like many of the mystery style board games, like the exit games. This is a one and done. The only thing you're going to be able to use in this box to use in like the full game in Further Tales from the Loop is going to be the the ten sided dice and maybe the map. Like there's there's nothing. I would I would have appreciated more meat, right? Like another small book, like how to continue your stories in the loop or a, a chapter in the back of the mystery saying, here's some follow-up things. Now that you've solved the mystery, here's some additional things. Like just something, a denouement even. 
Now I get it. Like the goal of this box is to make you want to buy the core rules. It, it, it's meant to be a taste, right? It's, it's make, meant to make you want more. And it does a great job of that. It gives you that taste. It gives you enough to make you want more. I just wish it was a bigger bite. Indeed. It is just a taste. And for some that might actually not be enough to fork over for the full game. Yeah. It's fun, but if you don't get enough of a feeling for what more you can do in the system and with the system, it, it may not quite do it. Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell. Now, as for introducing new players to Tales from the Loop, again, I had already played, so I'm, I'm looking at this, trying to look at this objectively. I think this does a great job. Like, it's a cut down version of the rule book, but like all the rules are there. It's not like they, they tacked it to bits and they only teach you part of it. Um, look back to those Shadowrun box sets for an example of where they did kind of hack it down. Like this is like almost like a quick start version of the rules. It's well written. It's well organized. It highlights all the year zero stuff. Like I actually expected it to be more cut down. I, I had a feeling it was going to skip over the bonuses. Like if you got a six, you succeed. And it wouldn't get into the fact that if you get a six on convince, you can ask the DM one of these five questions. I didn't expect that detail to be in here. So despite the fact I found the box bars rule wise, it was all there. Um, like in the characters, like those are full character sheets. The full details of the game are there. Yeah, though compared to say Pathfinder, the full rules as existed aren't as overwhelming to include in full. Yeah, <laughs> true. Like, and to be honest, I have not read my Tales from Root Core rule book, but it's it's I don't know 600, 400 pages. It's a big thick book, and I don't know. Like maybe the rules are just as short, um, but based on playing it. I didn't see much, but it's, I think that's part of it is just the, the year zero system is simple enough to include all of the core rules in a short, small rule book. Uh, the mystery. I think it's a great introduction to the setting. Like I really do. I don't want to give anything away, but this nails that feel of the setting and sticking to the principles of the tales from the loop, right. And showcases what makes Tales of Rim Loop different than every other kids on a bikes RPGs out there? Because there are a number now. When this first came out, it, it was a little bit more exclusive. Now, I do have a complaint about the mystery, and this gets back to the whole two settings in one book, the U.S. Swedish thing. And I think they they they, they fell down here because what they did is they include it, it's written as if it's set in Sweden. And what they did is they're like for U.S. players, we put orange brackets with the U.S. names for everything but it's not consistent. They didn't do it every time. Like in one chapter, they use it or one section, they use it and the next they don't, or only the first time a name comes up in a section, do they put it? So like, you have to remember them all. Um, most of Regis is there is player handouts that you can download online that are in the book that aren't, that don't do it. So if I'm playing in the U S and I hand you a note and it's giving you clues that certain people were certain places, all the names are wrong. Like all it features is the, the Swedish names. Like this is frustrating enough. Like, as I said earlier, I think they should have just went, it's in the U S or it's in Sweden or don't even mention the names. Maybe like just use the same names for the Swedish. And like, why, why even give me two different names? Yeah. The locations would be different. Like it, it's a really odd design choice. I, honestly, I don't know that the setting and by setting, I mean the location, not yeah. the, not the overall setting and theme, but I just, Maybe it, for U.S. players, it's a deal breaker, but I don't see the point of locking it down to a specific city in a specific, you know, state or, I mean, kids, especially because kids of a certain age don't really have that concept of global geography. Often the town is the world and things outside of it are something you wonder about, not necessarily need to be detailed. So if you said, this is the name of the town where the loop is, Mm -hmm. and didn't specify a country or a state or anything else, you'd be fine. <laughs> no, I totally agree. I, it's, it's, it's an odd choice. Like, I don't know why, like, especially in this, like do that in the full rules. That's why the book can be this thick. Present yeah. me with two detailed settings. Why they did it for this is I find an odd choice. I have to assume it's, it's a, it's the concept that the Americans won't want to play in Sweden. Like the, the North Americans though, I, as a Canadian, I don't care. I'll play in Boulder, Colorado, but we're, we're a little less uh, nationalistic. So maybe that's all it is. I don't know. Overall though, I got to say, I really dig this box set. Like, like, yes, it's sparse. I wish there was more there. It, it'd be nice if they gave me more stuff, but this is still a great introduction to the tales of the loop setting and system as an introduction box. It does what I want it to do. 
if you're at all curious about Tales from the Loop, just like go get this. It's not that expensive. If you're curious about this RPG, pick it up. Now, where I can't recommend this one is if you've already got the core rule book, and I'm speaking as someone who does, there's nothing really here. Like I, I checked it. You can go um, on Modifius's website or Free League Publishing's website and buy the dice. The core rule book comes with five mysteries. So I don't think you really need the little short 16 page one. Like the only thing that might be in here that's never, not anywhere else is a map. Do you really need a two-sided map of Boulder, Colorado and with a ring on it to show where the loop is? Like, I don't know. Uh, now, the caveat, of course, is if you like collecting RPG box sets like me, you might still want to pick this up. But if you're looking for new content for your Tales from the Loop game, I, I don't see, like if you already got the core rule book, you're probably good. For a more in-depth look at the Tales from the Loop starter set, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.